The Peter Schiff Show. In the uh, video blog podcast that I recorded on Friday of last week, I went over uh, a bit about the jobs numbers and the trade deficit that came out and, and, and discussed some of the implications there. But one thing I didn't notice or didn't remember to talk about was the fact that the Atlanta Fed did dourly revise its estimate of fourth quarter GDP as a result of the numbers that were released on Friday. And the downward revision took their estimate from 3.2 down to 2.7. 2.7 is the lowest the estimate has been since they began estimating a Q4. In fact, earlier on, in I think October, November of last year, the Atlanta Fed was up at 4.5% for their estimate of fourth quarter GDP, which is now down to 2.7%. So as the U.S. stock market was rising to an all-time record high, the Atlanta Fed was downwardly revising its Q4 2017 GDP forecast to an all-time record low. But let's assume that the Atlanta Fed is accurate at 2.7. I mean, maybe they're still being too optimistic, but let's say they hit the nail on the head and we get 2.7 then the entire year uh, for 2017 would see about 2.5% GDP growth. Now, how does that compare to Obama? Because, you know, everybody is talking as if the economy is rip-roaring now, that it's so much better now under Trump than it was under Obama. Well, during the second term of Obama, and I'd rather look at the second term because, A, it's closer in time to where we are right now, and B, His first term includes the Great Recession that he inherited. So let's just look at uh, the second term, which takes out some of that noise. So if you look at Obama's second term, GDP growth averaged 2.2% for the entire four years. So if that's the case, all right, 2.5 is a little bit better, about a little over 10% better GDP growth than we had for the average of the four years of Obama president. But if you take two of those years, 2014 and 2015, GDP grew by more than 2.5%. I think we were 2.6 and 2.9. So in other words, half of Obama's years as president beat the first year of Trump as far as GDP. So to me, 2017 just looks like another year that we had when Obama was president. Nothing's really different. I mean, 2.5 just fits in nicely with what we got while Obama was president. No real change. And everybody is talking about all this great economic growth that's taking place. It hasn't happened. Now, granted, there are people that are saying, well, you know, we haven't really had the tax cuts yet. The tax cuts don't take effect until next year. Well, sure, but that hasn't stopped the stock market from soaring, even though the tax cuts haven't happened. Obviously, they're looking forward. Well, maybe the economy has looked forward. Maybe there has been some increase in spending or investment in anticipation of these cuts. Maybe we've gotten a lot of the benefit. And despite that, we're still only at 2.5%. I mean, certainly Donald Trump is out there every day claiming credit, right? Oh, the stock market went way up because of me. Well, okay, well, the economy hasn't grown any faster. Isn't that your fault, too? I mean, if he's going to take the good, doesn't he have to get the bad? The bad news being that there has been no meaningful uptick in GDP growth, despite having Trump the president for an entire year. Now, maybe again, they're going to say, well, you know, the economy can't really respond until we fully absorb these tax cuts. And maybe the stock market can look forward but the economy doesn't. Let's say that is your argument. But I don't think that we're going to see a big pickup in growth in 2018. I mean, yes, there are some tax cuts, right? And they will help, but you can't look at the tax cuts in a vacuum. You got to look at what else is going on. And you got to look at what the tax cuts produce, larger deficits, much larger deficits than is being forecast. What are those deficits going to do to the economy? Maybe you think nothing. Maybe you think debt doesn't matter. I happen to think it does matter. I think a lot more debt is going to drag the economy down. 
it is going to make interest rates be much higher than they would have been absent the additional debt. It will make inflation higher than it would have been as far as extra money printing and higher consumer prices. I think it will do more damage to the structure of the economy. I think there is a cost to these deficits. It's not pure benefit. If that was the case, then just make the deficits bigger, right? If deficits don't hurt, then, you know, make them even bigger. Why didn't they cut tax cuts? Why didn't they have even bigger tax cuts? It was because they were constrained by the prospect of a increase in the deficit. But, you know, one of the things that nobody talks about, you know, about this tax cut is the increase in the capital gains rate. There is an increase here, right? The capital gains rate is 20%. And when you include the Obamacare tax, which has not been repealed, you know, that adds another 3.8%, you've got a 23.8% capital gains rate. That is not cut, right? Nobody gets a cut in capital gains. But if you live in a high-tax state and you still itemize your deductions, you no longer can deduct what you pay to your state in capital gains from what you pay to the federal government in capital gains. See here, I'm, I'm in Connecticut. Now, I'm not a Connecticut resident anymore. I'm a Puerto Rico resident, so I have zero capital gains tax. So this doesn't apply to me, but it applies to my neighbors who still reside in Connecticut. But if I still lived in Connecticut, right, the Connecticut capital gains tax is the same as the tax on all income because they don't differentiate. Same, You pay the same rate, whether it's capital gain or wages. But the rate is, I think, 6.9, right? just under 7%, just to make it, you know, so it doesn't sound as bad. But let's just say 7%. Well, last year, if I had capital gains and I was a Connecticut resident, I would pay 23.8% federal. But from that, I could deduct the 7% I paid to the state of Connecticut. So my effective tax rate would be 23.8 plus maybe uh, uh, 60% of that other other 7% that's left. So whatever that, maybe that brings me up to 28, 29% effective tax rate. But starting this year, there is no deduction. So you would pay 23.8% federal and the 7% state, you're almost at what? What is that? 30, 31 percent, right? 20, uh, 24 plus 7, 31 percent. That's a higher a rate, right? Everybody who lives in Connecticut, who lives in New York, who lives in New Jersey, who lives in Massachusetts, who lives in California, everybody who is an investor and who itemizes and probably most of the investors, right? People who are investing significant amounts of money are probably still itemizing. Every one of those individuals is going to face higher capital gains taxes. Now, why aren't the Republicans complaining about that? They always say, well, you know, it's a tax on capital. It discourages investment. Uh, it certainly uh, takes away money that could otherwise be made available for investment because we're, we're, we're taxing people more for risk taking. Right. All this is happening. Nobody is talking about the effects of this increase in the capital gains tax rate. That is what's happening. This is an increase. Because the effective rate that a lot of people are going to be paying on their capital gains is going up right now. You know, you can make the argument in some of these high tax states that some upper income people on their working income, even though they're, they, they can't deduct their state income taxes because the federal tax bracket is being lowered a little bit and because they may be able to shift some of their income to passive income, they may be able to quit their jobs and work as an independent contractor and therefore lower their effective marginal tax rates on the money they earn working, there is no way to get around the capital gains tax. So either you're going to face the same capital gains tax that you paid before, or you're going to get a tax increase. And I'm saying that everybody who itemizes, who lives in a high tax state, is going to pay higher capital gains taxes in 2018, to the extent that they harvest any capital gains, it would have paid had the Republicans left the tax code alone. But the bottom line and what I started to discuss here is that we haven't really seen an improvement in economic growth since Trump took office. We have seen an improvement in the stock market, but you know the stock market was going up before Trump was elected. This isn't the first year we've had a big gain uh, or last year. So we've just had a continuation. The same thing with the drop in unemployment. Yes, unemployment rates coming down, but it came down under Obama too. That hasn't changed. Same lousy jobs, 
same part-time jobs, same declining participation rate. In fact, Trump was out there bragging on Friday about the record low unemployment rate among African Americans. It was the lowest it's ever been. But again, that's because labor force participation has collapsed even more so among African Americans than non-African Americans. I mean, what is it? Maybe 40% of African Americans are, are, are out of the labor force. So they're not even counted. Now, obviously, it's not that these, you know, these African Americans are now so rich that they decided that they don't need to work anymore and they're all retiring. They're, they're, they're not, they're, they're not working because there's no jobs. That is the problem. But here is Donald Trump grabbing this meaningless headline, which he attacked. Again, he was out front on this issue. He was, this is a fraud. This is a hoax. Don't believe these numbers. And now he's, perpi- uh, he's, he's um, perpetrating the same hoax as president that he criticized as a candidate for president. And he's saying, oh, this is a record. This is great. The African-American community should go out and celebrate because they have such low unemployment. What they should be doing is not celebrating. The problem is their employment opportunities have disappeared. You have all these young, able-bodied black men not working. A lot of them are in prison. That's a huge problem. That's one of the reasons maybe a lot of people aren't unemployed is because they're in prison. So if you're in prison, then you're not unemployed, right? You can't file for unemployment if you're incarcerated. So that's part of the reason that you have a low unemployment rate is, you know, you have a high incarceration rate. These are all young people that should be working. They're not working, but if they weren't in jail, they a lot of them would be looking for jobs. They wouldn't have them, but they'd be looking and they would be unemployed. So again, you have President Trump is grabbing uh, these ridiculous headlines and trying to use them to convince the public that things are better than they are. Well, that's why Hillary Clinton lost. Right, because Hillary Clinton was trying to advance this agenda. She was trying to hide behind these phony numbers. The the reason that Trump got so many votes, the reason his message resonated was because he said the truth that these numbers were BS. Well, now he is, you know, spouting these same BS numbers and he is now going to be ticking off a lot of people he turned on. A lot of the people who voted for him well, they may be voting for Oprah Winfrey in 2020. I mean, if you saw uh, the uh, the awards uh, last night, there were a lot of women at the Golden Globes that were coming up. And of course, they were talking about harassment and equal pay for equal work. But the, uh, the biggest uh, talk, speech, whatever, uh, maybe a campaign speech was Oprah Winfrey. And now all of a sudden people are saying, Oprah 2020, she needs to run for president. You know, the thing is, if Oprah were to run for president in 2020, and if the U.S. economy is as bad as I think it's going to be, Oprah's going to win. She's gonna, She will beat Donald Trump because she will a, be able to take his message back to the same voters, only putting her spin on it. Because Trump won't be able to be the change guy anymore. He won't be able to be the guy that says the numbers are BS and I'm going to go drain the swamp. He is going to be the BSer. He is going to be in that swamp. And Oprah will be able to just borrow a page from his playbook and, and run with it. And, you know, if Oprah wins in the Democratic primary, who's going to beat her? Right. I mean, who's going to beat her for the black vote? Nobody. I mean, she will win that black vote. She will get what? 90% probably, of the black vote if Oprah were to run. And she'll get a lot of the women's vote, too, for being a woman. I mean, a lot of people will vote for her because she's a woman. I mean, and then when she runs for president, not only could she be the first woman president, but she'd be the first black woman president, right? That's a twofer, right? You get two so-called minorities, even though women aren't really minorities because I think they represent the majority of the population, but still they are a protected minority, but obviously, if you have a black woman, you could check both of those boxes for the oppressed uh, uh, minorities that are deserving of special privileges. Um, I think I think she'll win. Now, I mean, <laughs> that is a pretty dangerous uh, thing. I think, you know, Oprah is a businesswoman, at least, and she's a self-made billionaire, right? In fact, I don't think she inherited anything. I mean, uh, Trump at least, you know, got something from his father. So, I mean, she's certainly uh, in the realm of entertainment. 
did an incredible job of marketing and building her brand and, and, and building her program, but her politics are very, very left wing. And the type of people that she's going to surround herself with, I mean, very Bernie Sanders type people, as I said, I mean, enjoy these tax cuts while you can. They're all temporary. If there's a President Oprah Winfrey in 2020, 21, 2021, they are going to jack these taxes through the roof and they're going to increase the size of government dramatically, especially if they can blame, and they will, the massive recession on Trump, on Republicans, on tax cuts for the rich. And in fact, not only will we have a recession, but we will probably be in a bear market in stocks, right? So they'll hope we'll be able to say Donald Trump inherited a bull market and a booming economy, and now we have a bear market and a bust. We're now right back in a greater recession than the Great Recession. And the reason is because Trump came in there with his Republican buddies and cut taxes on the rich and created the same problem. And now, you know, we need Oprah. You know, we need a female touch, you know, women's touch. And we need to get in there and we need to get rid of all this uh, capitalism that, you know, we, the banks are controlling the country. And we need to, you know, get some women in there that, you know, can, 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 can get rid of all this testosterone and whatever it was. And, you know, we're going to fix this economy. We're going to make it work. And, you know, we're going to make it work for everybody. You know, a lot of this, too, the talk about this equal pay for equal work, and it's about time, and women are speaking up. You know, I put on my Facebook page an article about Iceland becoming the first country in the world to actually make it illegal to pay women more than men. All right Now, this this is the type of thinking. I'm sure there's a lot of people that were applauding there at these awards that, that would go for this. Yo, Iceland, this is a very advanced society, right? This is right. It should be illegal to pay men more than women. I mean, first of all, you know, I know they complain about, you know, in Hollywood, there are a lot of women that say, well, the men uh, make more than the women. Yeah, but, you know, not in adult entertainment, right? Not in porn. In porn, the women are paid a lot more than the men. I mean, maybe some of the men might even just do it for, for the fun of it. But the women are paid a lot more than the men. I mean, I guess so. I guess if they have a porn, I don't know if they make any porn in Iceland. They probably don't shoot any. But if they did, it's going to have to stop, right? Because it applies both ways. So you can't pay men more than women and you can't pay women more than men. And so if you're going to now, if you're going to shoot a, a porn movie in Iceland, you cannot pay the woman more than the man, which probably means you can't shoot porn in Iceland because that industry won't be there. Now, it's probably not there, but there are other industries that are going to be impacted by this ridiculous law that says you have to pay men and women the same thing. Because, you know, men and women aren't always going to be able to deliver the same amount of output, even if they're doing the exact same job. I mean, right, most men are stronger than most women, physically stronger, right? And, 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 you know, so let's say you hire a woman and a man to do the same job that involves just physical labor. And because of the strength, maybe the man could be more productive than the woman. Now, maybe the way an employer would be able to hire a woman is just pay her less. Right? Let's say you're just, you know, you're just loading things, you know, you're moving stuff from point A to point B. And let's say the guy can move stuff you know, maybe he, the guy can move 20% more stuff than the woman in the same period of time. Well, okay, well, I pay the guy 20% more and it all equals out. So now the women can still do the job. She's just going to be paid a little less because she's not as efficient, because she's not as strong. Well, see, now that's illegal in Iceland. So you can't hire women at all, right? You can only hire men, right? The way this law is going to backfire, and there's so many ways that this thing is going to backfire, but one of them is going to be uh, companies trying to stay small because the law in Iceland only applies to employers who have 25 or more people. And again, this is very stupid. All governments do this, right? They always kind of, they say, look, we want to protect. We don't want to overburden the small employer, but we don't mind overburdening the big employers because, you know, they can afford the burden, right? They can bear it. So they say only companies that have more than 25 workers uh, you know, then you can't pay men more than women. If you have 20 workers, then you can. Then you're free to pay men and women according to their productivity. But once you have more than 25 workers, then you got to pay people the same regardless of their productivity, right? You just got to pay them the exact same, 
whether they're a man or a woman. So the first thing that you're going to do is you're not going to hire more than 25 people, right? If you've got 25 people, you're stuck, right? You got a hiring freeze. If you got 26 people, you're probably going to fire one of them, right? Just let me get under the get to the 25. Um, now, obviously, if you've got a lot more than 25, then you know you'll see if there's a way that you can get down there. But obviously, this causes companies to stay small. Uh, another thing that it's going to do, obviously, is going to cause more companies to automate. Number one, just to get under the 25, if they're not now under it, or to stay under it, right? You want to hire more machines, you or you want to. Uh, invest in buying more machines, more computers. More companies will have independent contractors because they're not employees. A lot of those independent contractors may be in foreign countries because obviously they just can't go to a, a temporary firm because if that temporary firm has more than 25 people working for it, well, again, they're subject to the same ridiculous requirements. So to the extent that firms are outsourcing to stay under 25 employees, they might be outsourcing out of the country. Uh, because they have to hire from other countries that aren't limited by this same law. Now, the other thing, of course, an obvious thing that firms could try to do is just limit the number of female workers that they hire. That way, the problem is, is, is mitigated, right? The fewer women that work for you, the fewer people can complain that they're not being paid enough or the fewer uh, opportunities the government has to come in and examine you and say, oh, you know, you're not paying uh, this woman uh, enough. Now, another thing that they're going to do to the extent that employers hire women, see, one of the reasons that women get paid less than men in many cases is because um, they are more interested in non-monetary forms of compensation. See, a lot of women want more time off, right? They want to work fewer hours. They don't want to travel as much, right? They can't be away from the home. In fact, a lot of women, maybe they want to work a couple of days a week from home. So they value a lot of these non-monetary perks that they get. And so an employer may, 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 may do that. So let's say I've got a guy who's working and he's going to work every day, five days a week, maybe six days a week. He travels, right? He doesn't take a lot of time off and, you know, he's doing his job. And I have a woman who's doing the same job, but she, she works three days a week, four days a week, a couple days from home, never works weekends, doesn't travel, has a lot of flexibility, right? The woman is getting paid less. She's doing the same job, but she's not doing it as well. She's not doing it as efficiently, but it's okay because I'm not paying as much as an employer, right? I figure out trade-off. What is it worth? How much extra should I pay a guy who is putting in longer hours, right? And, 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 and doesn't need the flexibility. Here's a woman I've hired. She needs all these things. At what level does it make sense? Now, the free market figures this out. The women and the men and the employers who may be women too, you know, some of these women, right, may be paying women less than men, right? It's not just men that own businesses, right? Why are, are women discriminating against other women, right? Because I'm sure if you studied uh, the difference in pay between women and men, that the difference would be the same whether the payer, the owner of the business, was a man or a woman, right? So it's not discrimination based on sex. These are just... This is just on productivity, right? It has nothing to do with the gender. It just has to do with decisions and choices that people of certain genders happen to make, right? Because women, right, they give birth to the children. They want to rear the children, right? They are more committed to the home and to childbearing than the men. That's just nature, right? You got a problem with that, take it up with God, right? That's got nothing to do uh, with employers or employment law. But when you have the government coming in and saying, nope, you got to pay men and women the same amount of money. Well, now women no longer have the benefit of a flexible schedule. Now, if you're an employer, all right, you're a woman. If you want this job, you got to work five days a week in the office. You got to travel. You got to do all this. I can't give you the flexible schedule because I can't pay you less for the flexibility. I got to pay you the same as what I pay this guy. So you've got to work the same as this guy or you're not going to work. And ultimately that's what's going to happen. And of course, all of this, right, makes businesses less efficient, right? It's going to cause more businesses to have to spend more money preparing or insulating themselves from lawsuits, complying with these laws. And so what does this mean? That means that overall, on average, women and men are going to see their pay reduced, reduced, as a result of this law. And then, of course, the overall economy will be less productive, right? And so, again, everybody is worse off. 
But the politicians, yes, they get to get the votes of the women. Yes, this is terrible. We're going to put an end to this. We're going to make it illegal to pay a man more than a woman. And if any employer is caught paying a man more than a woman, we will put them in jail. Right? It's illegal. I mean, I wonder, I don't know, is there a jail sentence for that? Or is it just, you know, because if it's a crime, right, or is it just some kind of a fine? Or, I mean, I don't know, what level do you have to... Do you have to go to prison? But again, all this is is making it so much harder to be an employer. I mean, to the extent that you employ anybody, whether it's a man or a woman, that's a good thing, right? And whatever you pay them is a good thing. And if they don't quit, see, if men were really underpaying women, the women would quit, right? And, you know, all this nonsense about how you can hire, everybody is paying women less than men. If that was the case, then people would only hire women. I mean, if women will actually work and do the same work as men, but for less money, then why would a self-respecting, greedy capitalist hire any men? Just hire women and keep all the profit for yourself. The, the reason that that's ha not happening is because women are not getting paid less than men for doing the same work as men. To the extent that they're getting paid less, it's because they're doing less. But of course, also now they're going to have to have all this, you know, the, the government's going to have to look into a lot of these jobs because they're not going to be identical jobs. And they're going to say, but they have similar uh, training or similar education. It's going to be kind of comparable. Like it's not going to be equal pay for equal work. It's always equal pay for comparable work, right? There's going to have to be some kind of board, some kind of government bureau that's going to be micromanaging every decision and try to say, oh, this woman what she's doing is actually worth as much as this man. Even though the marketplace doesn't think so, we're going to think so, and then we're going to force you uh, to pay extra money. Well, maybe that means, you know what, if I have to pay this extra money, I'm just going to fire the woman. You're telling me i got to pay this woman the same as this man, and this woman is not as productive as this man for various reasons. Well, my choice is not then to just pay this. I'll just eliminate the position. right? So this is going to create all, far more problems than it's solved, but it's the example of the type of nonsense that we're going to get uh, in a um, Oprah Winfrey administration, which, you know, imagine, I mean, how far-fetched is that? Because people would have thought, oh, there's no way Donald Trump's going to be president, yet here he is. So if Donald Trump could be president, I mean, Oprah, I think, had a lot better ratings than Trump, right, if you want to compare the Oprah Winfrey versus The Apprentice. And, I mean, she's a much bigger household name. More people know who she is than who knew who Donald Trump was, uh, when he began. And as I said, you know, the country is going to be, I think, in much worse shape uh, when Trump is running for re-election uh, than at the end of Obama's term when, when Trump ran the first time. So th this is not a far-fetched idea, but it is a scary idea. And again, if it's not Oprah, it's going to be somebody just as bad. Maybe, you know, who knows? Maybe worse. You know, maybe, maybe the Democrats could come up with an even worse uh, presidential nominee than Oprah. But regardless, it is going to be a sharp, sharp turn to the left. Final thing, I mean, obviously, let me talk a little bit more about Bitcoin, uh, cryptocurrencies. You know, Bitcoin got above 17,000 on Friday. It, it had a huge rally on Friday and all the way up above 17,000. And then this morning, it was back below 14,000. Now, as I'm recording this, it's back above 14. It's you know, 14,800. The low I'm looking at on Bitstamp was 13,900. But you're talking about a 20% swing in the price of Bitcoin between Friday at the close of the U.S. stock market and, and Monday at the open. I mean, that's a huge amount of volatility over a weekend. You know, again, all these Bitcoiners two or three years ago, four years ago, when I said, hey, the currency is too volatile, how are you going to use it as a medium of exchange? What did they always say? Oh, the volatility is going to go away. Right? It's going to become less volatile over time. That hasn't happened. If anything, it's become more volatile over time. I mean, how are you going to use? In fact, I read this article that Microsoft, which had been using Bitcoin somehow, maybe through BitPay or something, just decided that it's too volatile. We can't use it. You know, even though they had some kind of service to try to minimize the volatility, it doesn't work. And they're just moving away from it. And they're saying, look, you know, we're just not going to use it anymore. So just pay me with Visa or MasterCard. But we're not going to take Bitcoin because it's too volatile. And I've been saying this from the beginning, that that was one of the reasons that it wouldn't work. Now, it's not the only reason. The, the other reason is that it's not a real store of value. 
It's 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 not money. I mean, you you know, people try to claim it's a store of value because a lot of value on paper has been created because the price of this of of, of Bitcoin has been bid up. But the reason it can't be a long term store of value is because you don't know what it's going to be worth in five years or ten years or twenty years. Is it going to be worth zero? It might. Now, is it possible it's going to be worth fifty thousand or a hundred thousand? Well, I suppose it's possible. But that doesn't mean it's a store of value. That means it's a speculative asset. It's a highly speculative asset. It may go way up or it may go way down. How is that a store of value? Right? How are you supposed to do long-term financial planning based on that? I mean, how are you supposed to have a life insurance policy that pays off in Bitcoin? Right? How are you supposed to do long-term planning right? where the medium of exchange is Bitcoin when you don't know if it's going to be worth nothing or worth, you know, a million dollars of Bitcoin, right? It's impossible to plan. And therefore, you're not, it's not going to serve as money. Money has to be stable. Now, yes, the dollar, the euro, they do lose value over time, but they kind of lose value in a predictable fashion. At least they have, right? How much is annual inflation? 2% a year, 3%, 4%, whatever it is. So people can factor those inflation expectations into their long-term planning. They do that now. There is no way that you can factor any long-term planning with Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency because it's impossible to know. And even if you are one of the believers that believes that this is going to be the new money, you don't know where the price is going in the short run. Even a lot of people that like it will concede that, hey, Bitcoin can go to 5000 before it goes to 50000 Okay, well, then how is that money? How are you going to use that as a medium of exchange? Because it can't be a store of value. It's not a safe haven. Anything that could collapse that much. I mean, 20% over a weekend. It's just a normal weekend. I don't know if there was any spectacular news event that came out. Just a typical weekend where the value swings by 20%. Right? So that's not a store of value. There's no stability there. There's no safety in something that, that that's that volatile. And you certainly can't use it uh, to conduct commerce. You can't buy and sell stuff with it and run a business and price things in Bitcoin. I mean, yes, can you cash in your Bitcoin and use the proceeds to buy something? Sure, because you could do that with any speculative asset. I can sell my stocks on Friday and use the money to buy something on Monday or over the weekend, right? You could always sell. You could always liquidate a speculative asset. But I would say that Bitcoin is more speculative than the stock market, Right. I mean, so you might as well say the stock market's going to be money, right? Because it's less volatile than Bitcoin. The stock market doesn't swing 20% between Friday's op- close and Monday's open. Nothing does that other than cryptocurrencies. So you probably got the most speculative asset on the planet are cryptocurrencies. So why would you choose if you're looking for money? If you're looking for a medium of exchange, why would you pick the most speculative asset that exists? Right, the whole idea behind a medium exchange is we want to have something that's very, you know, uh, non-speculative, right? Non-volatile, something that's really stable, so we can plan, so we can price things, right? That, that, so this this is actually the opposite of uh, of what people have been have been predicting. But again, too, the transaction costs have skyrocketed Bitcoin to the point that even if it was stable in price, it's still it's still too expensive to use. Unless you're, you know, you're buying something really expensive, like a car, you know, you're buying a fifty thousand dollar car. I guess it doesn't matter if if the transaction costs fifty bucks. But if you're buying a five dollar cup of coffee, it matters. And that was supposedly the big selling point. So meanwhile, the volatility is continuing to to pick up. But what I think should uh, be worrying uh, the Bitcoin crowd is that all this volatility is taking place well below the twenty thousand high. Right, these spikes that we've seen have not sent uh, Bitcoin in new highs, and in fact, we are trading still in bear market territory. If you want to define a bear market as a twenty percent decline uh, from the peak, because we went from twenty thousand down to under eleven thousand, so we have had a bear market, and I think that you know we haven't made a new high yet. Now, I'm not sure how this compares to those previous short-lived bear markets. Uh, that we had last year. But I think this is the longest one. I think this is the longest since then where we've pulled into a technical bear market and haven't made a new high. So this maybe is the longest bear that we've had, but it could be the indication uh, that something much bigger 
is happening. And of course, we've had all of this hype, all of this good news, futures contracts, ETFs, all kinds of stuff, big institutions, Peter feel I'm buying Bitcoin, all this good news, and we're not making new highs, right? We're distributing Bitcoins. I think we're distributing from some of the strong hands. Maybe some of the guys that got in a long time ago, they're selling out some of their Bitcoins to some of these new guys, uh, small investors all around the world that are opening up their accounts and you know buying their piece of the dream, right? The, the fear of missing out, they're just getting in there. You know, the millennials, I was reading these articles, you know, most millennials would rather be in cryptocurrencies than in the stock market. They have more trust in cryptocurrencies. They probably, they, they know as little about cryptocurrencies as they do about the stock market, but they see the headlines. They probably have friends that, that own cryptocurrencies. They don't have any friends that own stocks because the most millennials are broke, right? They don't have any stocks, but some of them have cryptocurrencies and, and now they're, they're rich. And so other people want to get rich. So I think we're distributing, uh, from strong hands to weak hands. Uh, we are potentially forming a head and shoulders top. I mean, you know, we haven't gone through the neckline yet. Am I saying that it's 100% no? I mean, is it possible that Bitcoin can go back above 20,000 and go to 25,000? Of course it's possible. You know, I don't know what the probability is on that. And I do think, though, the higher uh, that you think it's going to go, the less probable that event is going to be. Uh, but I think the odds of a significant decline are improving with each day that we spend below the old highs. And as long as we continue to build out this shoulder, uh, we have the potential of cracking. And the way the stock, I mean, the way these currencies trade, I mean, Bitcoin can go down very quickly. It's not like, you know, 20% declines happen over the span of a year. They can happen in an hour, you know. And, and, and so this is like, you know, and I don't know how long it takes to execute a trade or get out of it. I know there's been complaints now that people try to sell and it takes a long time. Believe me, if this market really starts to fall, I mean, who knows if it'll even be possible uh, to get a sell in there. We'll see. We'll see what happens if we really get a panic. We haven't had that yet. We've had Bitcoin drop 10, 20% in an hour, and no one's even panicked. Like, most people don't even care. This is just noise as far as most people are concerned. So at some point, they're going to care. Uh, and then when they do, we'll find out just how low this currency, this you know, these digital currencies can go and how quickly they can get there. And then we'll see if people are still as sanguine about, well, riding it out. I mean, if Bitcoin goes to 5,000 or 1,000, are they still going to be just as confident that the sky's the limit as they were at 20,000? <music>